I was down with the no way up and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free. Yeah. <laughs>
sisters in Christ. What an incredible day to be alive in our Lord. I said, that's right. We need to shake ourselves every now and then. We need to remind ourselves whose we are and who we are in God. So I thank God this morning as there is a powerful word that I have for you. And I just want to get right to the word because it is exciting. It is something that's blessed me already as I was studying. And I know this is, some, this is something special. You're going to need to let somebody know that this word is being preached this morning. So grab your Bibles, grab your uh, devices, whatever it is that you use. And we're getting ready to go into a powerful Word of God. We're going to Galatians chapter 6. Navigate to Galatians chapter 6. The book of Galatians in the New Testament. Hasn't our God um, done well? I, I hope our God has done wonders for you like he has for me. I, I'm trying not to give my whole testimony in this word today, but there's a powerful word that God wants to pre preach to you that can change the direction or tra trajectory of your life. Let's look at Galatians chapter 6. I'm going to read from the American Standard Version. Follow me in um, as I read through this text from verses, uh, let's see. We're going to read from verse 7 to 10. All right, let's do that. Verse 7 to 10. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth unto his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not be weary in well-doing. Did someone just catch that? Don't be weary this morning. Let us not be weary in well-doing. Somebody just woke up. Say to yourself, I'm not weary. Talk to yourself. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Join me in a, a quick word of prayer. Father God, I ask that you would anoint uh, me afresh with your precious Holy Spirit, that you would speak to someone who needs deliverance today through this word and that you would make sure that exactly what they need is what they're going to get. Bring them to a place, Lord, of understanding the preciousness of this time together in your word. In Jesus' name, Lord, I praise you and thank you. We're going to use, uh, for as long as the Spirit of the Lord will allow, from this thought, you better believe that. I'll say it again. There's some street stuff here, some slang talk. You better believe that. All right? Got to get my gangster on when I say that. You better believe that. There you go. That's how it's supposed to go. I was watching the movie The Day the Earth Stood Still, the 2008 version starring Keanu Reeves. It was a remake of the 1951 sci-fi classic. And in this movie, if you don't, it's about an alien who comes down to Earth who's representing a group of, gal of aliens from other galaxies who have passed judgment on the Earth because of how destructive mankind has become. And so they sent this alien down. His name is Klaatu. And as soon as he got here, the armed forces kicked into play they arrested him, they handcuffed him, they detained him, they took him down into this little area, they drugged him, they interrogated him, and the whole time he's asking, can I speak to your leaders so I can tell them what my message is? All he got was treated roughly, but he escaped. And when he escaped, he went and found another alien named Mr. Wu, who had been here 70 years watching the earth to send messages back. And when he got to Mr. Wu, Mr. Wu told him, surely I found out that the man is destructive, they won't change, and they're stubborn, and they're violent. 
And so Klaatu said, that's all I need. There was a big spear that had come down. He put in motion the destruction of man. Now watch this. They were going to destroy man, but save the earth. So he, he was running. He was actually running around with another doctor, Helen Bronson, who was played by Jennifer Connelly, who was acting friendly toward him. And she's the one that he finally gave his message to. And he told her, there is nothing. There's no hope for you. We are going to destroy. We got to save the earth. And the only way to do that is to destroy man so the earth can survive. And she was trying to convince him, give us one more chance. And she also had her son played by Jaden Smith. She was her stepson. And there was a professor who had been a, um, who had won actually, um, he was a, a decorated professor, Dr. Barnhart was his name. So he had won the Nobel Peace Prize. So he actually said, look, give us another chance. After spending time with them, he saw another side to man. You know, sometimes there is another side to a person and God can just get to it. I didn't want to stop there, but there's another side to you instead of the frightened, uh, fearful, uh, weak, uh, failing side of you. You got to let God touch that other side. Amen, somebody. And so we found out that he said, there is another side to you. I'll stop the destruction, but there's going to be a huge cost. And so what he actually did is right to the last minute, as the army was useless against the weapons they were using, he actually walked into the destruction and stopped it. But just as he said, watch this, because it was the message of the whole movie. Sometimes you miss this when you see the day the earth stood still. Because he was given another chance, when he did, the whole earth stopped. There was no power. There was no electricity. There was no nuclear power. Cars weren't moving. Computers weren't working. Nothing. Where airplanes weren't flying. Because the message of the movie is every now and then, if you want to get better, you got to stop and think about the consequences of not changing. All right. I know I just said it. Somebody. Somebody better hear what I just said. Because this message was authenticated by John Maxwell, the author, the speaker, uh, the leadership guru, when he said that the problem with most people is people only change when they're hurt enough that they have to, when they learn enough that they want to, or they are given enough that they're able to. Let's say it again. People only change when they're hurt enough that they have to, when they learn enough, when they are hurting, to figure out, I want to change, and then again, when they are given enough so they can change. It's funny how people never find a way to get to a better life and they have to go through those three changes. But my problem today is God's children should never have to go through any of that. Listen to me. Why do you wait till you're hurting when God has offered you everything freely? Most of us don't change until we're out of options. Most of us can learn because you've been in church all your life, you've heard messages all your life, and yet, with all that knowledge, until you get to the point to say, I want to change, you're still going to stay where you are. And thirdly, you've got to follow through. There are some blessings, there are some things God wanted to do for you, and the only reason you don't have it is because you did not follow through. Write that down. I need to follow through. You didn't follow. It wasn't God. God was ready. He gave you what you needed. And so we should never have to go for that, go through that before we change. This message is about understanding that when God gives us something or says something to us, our job is to act on it. Because the reality is God has given us everything we need in this life. I just say, everything we need, anything you can think of, God has given us. If you were to go with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, chapter 1, I mean, excuse me, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, you know the scripture very well. Watch this. According as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us to glory and virtue. I don't want to move too fast. We got everything we need. He gave us the power so that we have everything we need for this life and to be godly through the knowledge of him who called us, to, meaning through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And it says, how do we access it? Whereby are given unto us, this is still 2 Peter chapter 1, this is verse 3. It says, given unto us great 
and exceed, exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature. Oh, this is good. I can't stop. You actually have a divine nature. Which nature are you walking in so that we can escape this world that is driven by lust? God is saying that we can control whatever we're going through through the power that God has given us, and we access that through the promises that God has given us. And if you know 2 Corinthians 1 and 20, it tells us that all the promises, great help somebody, in God, in Him, it says, are yes and amen. Listen, whatever you're asking God for, I'm getting excited because He said the answer is yes. Asking for healing, yes, there's a promise for that. Asking for deliverance, and yes, there's a promise for that. Asking for your family to be better, there's a promise for that. He said we got to grab those promises because we have power and we have all things that we need. Somebody here is asking, or somebody here listening to me, you need to just ask for what you need because God said we have all power to life and godliness. So the problem is if we have all this power, you're listening to me, you're probably where I am. If I have all this power, if I have all these things, then why in the world am I suffering like I do? Why am I going through what I'm going through? Why is it so hard sometimes to make it? Am I talking to somebody? I'm not the only one that knows sometimes darkness seems to surpass the light in my life. But I want you to know today it is not God's fault. It is not God's fault. Here is the main problem. I'm going to show you this. It seems that we never really believe God and take him at his word. And if we did, we would act on the promises and not violate his word. Do you realize that most of our Christian journey, me included, I can tell you since I've been walking with God, a lot of times what I'm actually doing is I'm living with God or walking with God, watch me now, through the, um, through the consequences that I have created by my actions and hoping that God actually has enough grace to carry me through. Now, there's nothing wrong with grace, but we're not always supposed to be just living with God based on our ignorance that has created consequences, has created situations for us where there are consequences, all because we did not act on God's word. Not going to lose anybody. Stay with me today. You have a word in you that if you acted on, you wouldn't be in the position you're in right now. You have a word in you that you have more strength in the position that you have right now. Hallelujah. You have a word in you that right now you've heard it, I don't know how many years, how many months, I don't care how long you've heard a word from God that can bring you liberty. The only problem is God's word has the power. We have to act on God's word. From the beginning of time, I know, somebody's looking at me saying, well, Pastor, you're not talking to me. Uh, I love the Lord. He heard my cry. He every groan. And I love the Lord. Oh, that's good. Then my question is, with the power God just said through those all things, why don't you have what you need? Let me prove it to you so I can show you how we fix this thing in the message today. First thing I want to prove to you is from the beginning of time in Genesis chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, God only had two people on the earth. From the beginning of time, I can show you from Genesis to Revelation, people have heard God's word, know that God's word was the way, and we violate God's word anyhow. And all we've been doing is walking around lazily, living by grace. Now watch me. There are a lot of days I need grace. Somebody write that down. I need it. But I should not have my whole walk dictated by me violating the very thing that's supposed to save me. So you, in Genesis 2, 6 and 7, it says, And uh, God commanded man, of all the trees in the garden you may eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you may not eat thereof. And the day that you do, you shall surely die. God was talking about spiritual death. Oh, I don't have time. There's times right now that the only thing wrong with your walk this morning is your spirit is dead and your flesh is more alive than your spirit. And so God said they suffered a, a spiritual death. What happened? They heard the word. God said, you can eat anything. There's only two people on the earth. And just those two people couldn't even do what God's word said. You can eat anything, but don't eat that tree. They did it anyway. He 
because we have a propensity of violating it because of the sin nature in us. And they were kicked out of the garden and set on a road of living with their consequences based on the grace of God carrying them. That's right. And if we keep going, look at the children of Israel. They were coming up through the wilderness. God had delivered them from Egypt. You with me? God had delivered them from Moses. I mean, from Pharaoh. Moses had stretched out his rod. Open the Red Sea. They had miracle after miracle. Left Egypt with gold. And yet all they did is complain. Forget that. They made it through the wilderness somehow. With all their complaints. But in Numbers chapter 13, that famous verse, you know it. They got there to the edge of the promised land. A lot of them were still alive. And God said, uh, Moses, send some men in to see the land I gave you. See the land I gave you. But instead of going in... And seeing the land, they went in and saw all the problems with the land. They saw all the problems with what God's word was asking them to do. So instead of seeing the miraculous power in God's word, they saw, come on, it's not just them. We can sit down as soon as God makes a promise. You may be sitting in a church service. You may hear me this morning. And as soon as I make it, you'll be figuring out, well, that won't work for me. That's a good word, but that, ain't, that don't pertain to me. It does pertain to you. The problem is you're, you're not willing to act on what God has because you don't trust God and you don't take him seriously. Watch me. I'll give you one more thing that's indictable, and that is in Acts chapter 5. The infamous, this shows that we don't really take God seriously. The infamous act of Ananias and Sapphire. In there, you know what happened? The early church was growing. They were, it says God was adding to the church daily those that should be saved. And as God was adding to the church daily those that should be saved, you know what happened? People started getting, uh, when they saw the miracles God had done. And in that fifth chapter, right after they got together in this communal way, where they were taking all of these new babes and saying, we're going to make sure everybody can survive because there's opposition against this new movement. So bring what you have, lay it at the apostles' feet, and we're going to make sure everybody's fed. Ananias and Sapphire. Acts chapter 5, verse 3. You know what it says? It says, they looked at, uh, they went up there and lied about how much they sold their property for. It was their property. They lied about it. God said they didn't have to do it, but they lied about it. That's not the problem. The problem is to show you how we just ignore God is Acts 5 and 3, when Peter said, how is it, Ananias, that you have allowed Satan to get you to lie about how much you sold the land for? How is it you lie? Out? He said, you're not lying to man. You lie to the Holy Ghost. God said many times we have promised him, and the reason we don't do it is because we won't act on God's word. That takes me down to this text. Here is our salvation. Watch, watch, watch what God said. This is awesome. Here's what God said. This, this text is one of the most powerful texts in the world because in the Bible because what it does, it lets us know that if we take God seriously, if we believe God and act on it and we take the word and plant the word and use the word and act on the word, he said a miraculous harvest will come in your life that nobody can stop. Listen to me. If you got a word right now and there's a problem in your life, if you take this passage of scripture that I'm about to tell you, then you can right now decide to plan a whole new existence in your life. And that is, if you don't take the word seriously, you have the word, you can look for there to be a whole lot more trouble, darkness, destruction, and weakness, and failure, because that is what you're planning. Galatians 6 and 7, it is a scary text, it is a miraculous text. It is scary because God said, be not deceived. Don't be crazy, God is not mocked. I know your motives. I know your heart. You can cry all you want to cry. I'm not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that's what he's going to read. And I like what God said because he said, I can take this life I have now and turn it around by sowing differently. Somebody wake up now, sit up, get with me in this text. There are three points I'm going to give you through this text. I'm going to move quickly, but you don't want to miss this. These are gems right here. This sixth chapter of the book of Galatians is going to show us the practical application of how God spoke to the Galatians to get to that text. So the three things I want you to write down, that's right, get excited. I want you to write down that if you're going to be the kind of saint 
that understands how to get power out of their life, you must first, you must first in your life understand how to bear your brother's faults. Uh, you're going to say, Okay, this is not that kind of message, is it? No, I'm telling you the quality of spiritualness that it takes to be able to bear your brother's fault. And that's the quality that brings the miracle. Man, I'm preaching this morning. You better stay with me. And the second thing you must learn to do is build up your own faith. And the third thing you must learn to do is believe that God does not fail. Bear your brother's faults. Build up your own faith. Believe God doesn't fail. Why did Paul have to give this message to the Galatians. It makes sense, and you need to know where we are so you have a context for the text. First of all, if you go to Acts chapter 15, you'll find out that the birth of the church of Galatia, it gives you the story of the fact that when the Galatian churches were all coming together, they were made up of Gentiles and Jews. And there were still a lot of people trying to force people to live by the Torah or live by Mosaic law, live by the law of Moses. These were called Judaizers. And what they were doing after people got free and got saved, please listen to this, nothing else set you free but God. And now you listen to all the critics as to why you shouldn't serve Jesus. That's what was happening. They came into, into the area following after Paul, trying to destroy the works that they had, saying that if, if you're going to really be saved, you still have to follow the Jewish law, follow the laws of the Torah, especially circumcision, and then get saved. What they actually did, they were destroying justification, salvation, by justification through faith alone. Salvation is justified through faith alone. Not faith plus anything. Not faith plus works. Not faith plus what day you worship. Not faith plus how good you are. The only way we got saved is Jesus paid the cost. And that's, I don't have time to get into the whole redemption plan, but it's the only plan that worked. So Galatians is a book about liberty. It's about our freedom now that while we're in Jesus, now I'm not talking sanctification, I'm talking about salvation. See, and, and what happens is you got a lot of people, even today, popping up with all of these little sects attacking Christianity because it's the problem, it is the product of the devil to try to destroy where your real strength is. So he'll get you a cousin or an uncle who will find out they're a black Jew, or they're going to find out they can go into some other kind of religion that brings them back into a worse kind of relationship or works kind of salvation. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, y'all Christians are wrong. Y'all worship on Sunday. You gotta worship on Saturday. No. The problem is it really don't make a difference what day you worship, but the difference with us worshiping on, worshiping on Sunday, which was in the New Testament, the first day of the week, and that was established, that pattern was established in the early church. But also the problem is God doesn't care what day you worship. The difference is you are bound by bondage to worship on Saturday, and so you're trying to work out your salvation. You actually feel, I'm not saying how to worship on Saturday. And then you want to actually bring that to us. No, I don't see God do too much in my life. I've been set free. Stand fast in the liberty where with God has set you free. Am I helping somebody? I don't care what your neighbor say, your uncle say, your cousin say. Don't believe anybody but God. Because the reality is, once you were set free, he let the sun set free is free indeed. Quit bringing yourself back under bondage, trying to live in this world. Talking about justification because of racial implications. And justification because this religion wants black people to do well. But this religion wants poor people to do well. No, God wants everybody to do well. And you got to quit trying to get into this sectarianness, messing up your salvation. I went too far. And then we found out that in this text, Paul, the first two chapters, he wrote the book of Galatians. He wrote this letter under duress because he was upset about how they were trying to stop people from getting power. So he wrote this first two chapters, explain his autobiographical calling from God, how he was called directly by Jesus to go to the Gentile. He gave them his credentials. This chap chapter 3 and 4 was the actual um, theological understanding of salvation by faith. He even goes in there, Abraham even moved by faith, before there was a Jesus dying. And then the last two chapters where we are is practical. So let's look at those. They're the practical application, chapter 5 and 6. Let's look at this. So go to verse 1 of our text. 
We're talking about now, my first point is you must learn how to bear your brother's faults. Look what Paul started with. The first verse of chapter 6 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fall, you which are spiritual. Stop right there. Spiritual. This is why he starts with our brother. Because he knows within our heart is nothing but selfishness, nothing but our own welfare. But he said, you that are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. I like that. So first of all, he said, brethren. He lets us know the connection. He's talking to the church. He said, because it's in the church where we have our division. It's in the church where people will come in and be hypocrites when it comes to looking at someone else's sins and faults and their sins and faults. So we have this dichotomy that some people live by where they're very religious in church and they praise God and they smile. But the only thing also is when they leave church, they don't have that same kind of peace. And sooner or later, in the church, because we're phony, everybody follow me? That's why there's so much difficulty in the church. Because what you try to hide will sooner or later come out. I got, I got an example. There was this older lady who was in church, and she was kind. One of those mothers you look out and she oozed in the Holy Ghost. You see her with a little church head on, and she got her cane, and she walks around smiling everybody. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And so this other lady who was a visitor was behind her. As they walked into the church that Sunday, the lady who was behind her, you know, spoke to her. She smiled at her. But our older lady had to go to the bathroom. So the other lady walked around her, walked on in the church, and sat down. Oh my God, you would have thought there was a fire going on. Us just ran over to her and said, hey, hey, you got to get out of that seat before she see you. And she said, what do you mean? She said, she coming, you got to get out of that seat. She looked around and said, who? Then she saw this nice old lady on her cane. She said, her, that sweet lady. She said, uh-huh. Oh, I just said, if you don't get out of that seat, you're going to see how sweet she is. Because she's sweet until she come in and find out you got her seat. Then she flipped the script. And so we all know that sweetness. We all know that sweetness. We all know that sweetness is just an act. How many of you are like that? Get to church and we know that sooner or later that hypocrisy comes out. That's why I say real spirituality is concerned about other people and not about your own self. He said restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. He tells us the first move is restoration. Not talking about it. The first move is that in meekness. Meekness means that we actually go in with our own strength under power. But look what he said, that we actually become spiritual. Then he gives us four examples right in the text of what spirituality is. He said, restore, you see a brother in a fall. That means caught. He got caught up in something. Mm -hmm. Don't act like you've never been caught up. I said, don't act like you've never been caught up. And then not only that, he said, in a fault. Fault is the word transgression. He has a transgression, meaning that he has fallen or he has violated something he knows in God's word on purpose. And he's caught up in it and he needs help getting out of it. It says, restore him. He said, first of all, when you restore him, watch the spirituality. Do it in a spirit of meekness. Meekness, the first point of spirituality is, when I go in there, I realize I don't have the right to be talking about anybody because I know how hard it was to get out of my sin when I fell. Hallelujah. So I need to write that down. Where the real saints that will tell you, I'm not talking about anybody. Not only have I wrestled, I could be wrestling right now. Thank God for his grace that covers me. Why? He said, restore them in the spirit of meekness. And then he said, not only meekness, uh, considering yourself. Watch out that you don't be condemned. What it's saying is, maybe the same habit they're fighting might have been the habit you were fighting. And said, so you can't really go in there. All, you know what I'm saying is, if you got a crack habit, don't go rushing all out to the crack houses trying to save your brethren when you know yourself might fall back into the crack. Don't run around driving women in your car if that was your weakness. Don't run around telling somebody, oh, man was hitchhiking. I gave him a ride to the liquor store. Uh-huh, and you left with a 40 and some vodka. All I'm saying is you got to make sure you consider yourself. We're ready to face our own stuff. 
Man, we got a habit of doing judging people for their sins. Straight out. See it. But we judge ourselves by our intentions. So we let ourselves off the hook by saying, oh, 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 that's not what I intended to do. So now you feel like you're still spiritual. No, you got to consider yourself. And watch out that you are not tempted. All it's saying is you got to make sure that you don't let the temptation come into you because you might not have that sin, but you might fall for something else. Let each person prove themselves. Look at the content of spirituality. Restore your want in meekness, considering yourself, that you might be tempted. And then the last thing is verse 4. Let each man prove their own self. I love that. He says, start looking at yourself. Uh, I can remember, uh, I know you're supposed to hear this because, you know, I'm the pastor and you know, I'm in love and all this kind of stuff. But Marcia and I were arguing one day, one of those loud arguments. It, it was real loud, but she was downstairs and I was upstairs. And she's hollering at me, and I'm hollering down at her. But I'm getting dressed. She's already out there dressed. And she's hollering at me. And she said something so disrespectful. I was getting ready to run down the stairs, but I wasn't fully dressed. But in order for me to run down the stairs, I got to pass the mirror. When I got to the mirror, still hollering at her, I caught a glimpse of myself in the mirror. I saw a demon. I, I saw, when I looked at saw my face wrinkled up and I was spewing this fire. I knew then that no matter what she had said, I was allowing myself to be overcome by the anger and the evil. That's all he's saying here. Look, prove and examine your own self. Don't be trying to talk about other folk. What helps us do these things, I found out? If we can remember, we are servants. I want you to write this down. The word servant, there is another translation of servant that is called hupo reetis. Hupo reetis. And that actually means an under rower. That the reality is a servant understands that they have to do the stinkiest work. The, the example is of the under rowers who were in the ship, making the ship go. While everyone was up top, all of the garbage, all of the mess was thrown underneath, but you got to keep rowing the ship. Cooperatis. And that word means servant. What it's saying is the servants of God are under rowers, so we do not get beside ourselves because we remember our condition is I am just a servant. And when I remember whose servant I am, my strength comes back. And that's when God said, I give you the mysteries of my kingdom. I think that's 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. It talks about we are stewards of the mysteries of God. Here's what I want to tell you. You can't even get God's strength until you change your attitude and learn to become a servant. Then it says right here that we are to build our own faith. Verse, verse 5. Let's get to the nitty gritty. Verse 5 says, every man shall bear his own burden. I hate those people. Every sin in your life is always somebody else's fault. You've been like that since you've been saved. You've been making excuses with it. Everything you do, and that is an immature move when everything you look at is what somebody else did to you. Matter of fact, you need to understand that it was Chuck Swindoll that says 10% of life is what happens to me. 90% of life is how I handle it. 10% is just what happens to me. 90% is how I handle it. And then I like a quote by John Maxwell that says, The greatest day in your life and mine is when we decide to take total responsibility for our actions. It is the day that we become mature and we grow up. How you ever seen those kind of people? They never take responsibility. You push, they push back. You say something, you try to point to them what's going on, and they all why it's not them. And that's why we can't be blessed because we'll never take responsibility for our actions. You can't bear your own burdens if you don't understand that there is supposed to be suffering in your work with God. It was Pastor Paul in chapter 4 of Philippians who said, watch this, um, 4 verse 11 to 12, I've learned to be content no matter what state I'm in. I've learned to be hungry and full I've learned to be up and down. I've learned how to suffer. He said, I've learned all of these things. I'm instructed everywhere I go to be hungry and full, to suffer. Here's what he's saying is, 
that you got to learn and start doing it on purpose. Y'all know my road rage attitude. It's getting better. It's getting better. Somebody out there laughing, you got it too. But here's what happened. I'm driving down the road, and one day God told me as I was riding, somebody riding in front of me, jerking, stopping, jerking, and I'm getting all upset, and I'm heading somewhere, but I wasn't late. You know what God said to me? Slow down and enjoy the ride. So what? You got to handle some stuff. Slow down and enjoy the ride. Let's get to the nitty gritty of this. And then he said in verse 7, here's what, how we get to the point that we say, you better believe it. God said it, you better believe it. Six and seven. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. So every man saw it, that shall he reap. Here is the better believe it section of our text. Here is where you're going to gain your blessing back. Somebody say that out there, you better believe that. Come on, say it with me. You better believe that. You better believe. What do you better believe? You better believe it because God said, be not deceived, God is whatever you sow, you're going to reap. Here's what God is saying. I set some laws in motion. You are the product of the seed you've been sown. Where your life is, is what you've done in your life. You created the life you live. Because your seeds always brings a heart. God has set laws in the universe. I don't have time. The laws of thermodynamics, the laws of, of gravity, what goes up must come down. Those are laws. Laws of thermodynamics. Uh, everything's going to get old. Everything's going to rust out or wear out. That's a law in nature. Nothing stays new forever. And also, you can't plant corn and get strawberries. You can't plant apples and get watermelons. Are y'all with me? God is saying, you're complaining to me about a blessing you want when you should look back and see, what did you plant? The harvest you have is what you planted, and that's the harvest you're living now. Now, you don't like the harvest, but that's what you planted. He said, and be not deceived. He said, and don't think lightly about who I am. God said, be not deceived. Don't remember I'm the same God who blessed you that also knows that my word has to be maintained and obeyed and there's consequences in my word that I allow to happen because I put it in most people. Somebody's getting this right now. So what God is saying is, I'm not mocked. He said, I'm not made fun of. Uh, I'm not second guessed. You just can't say, well, I know the word, but I'm still going to do it my way. And then sit in church and cry for a blessing. Where is my this? Where is my that? God said, where is your seed? The harvest you're getting is based on what you have done. If you've got a life of grace and joy, you've been planning grace and joy. I pity people that live in a situation with a negative person. Because negativity breeds negativity. I've seen people that I don't understand. They're not happy until they're complaining. They're not happy until, and if somebody says something, they're not happy until they can disagree with them. And it's because they've lived in this situation, they've been planting seeds so long, that's the harvest of their heart. It's the harvest of their mind. It's the harvest of their walking God. And every day they're still asking for blessings. Lord, bless this. And God is saying, I wish you'd plant some seed so I can give you what you asked me. I don't care who you think you are listening to me today. I don't care if you're Will Smith slapping Chris Rock at the Oscars. You may be big, you may have just won an Oscar, but look at the fallout and the consequences. Everything has a consequence. You just didn't believe God. But God is saying, look, this word that I'm preaching today, you better believe that. You better believe it. You keep violating my word and you know it. The harvest you're going to get is going to be what you planted. And he said, if you slow to your flesh, you're going to reap with the flesh. Most of us are there. If you show to the spirit, you'll reach eternal life. If I, and it's harder to show to the, the, the spirit when your flesh is in control. So you got to put your flesh under. You. you ever heard that terminology, uh, face the music, you got to face the music? Let me tell you where it came from. There's an origin to you got to face the music. Many years ago, a man wanted to play in the Imperial Orchestra. And he wanted to play in the Imperial Orchestra, but he could not play a tune, couldn't play an instrument. But he was a man of great wealth and influence, so he demanded that he have, be allowed to join the orchestra so that he could sit there and play before the king. So the man gave him a flute. 
because of his influence, put him on the second row. And every time the band would start playing, he'd pucker his lips, he'd raise his flute, and he'd blow. And he wasn't blowing anything, but he was getting all the accolades, he was getting all the standing ovations. Well, then one day, that conductor who let him in the orchestra died. And the new conductor said, I'm going to have individual auditions so I can see the skill set of each one of my uh, those who play instruments. And, he's, and the man was, he said, oh my God, I'm scared to death. He said, how in the world could they do that? And so he went off and tried to hide. Everybody else, one by one, got tested. They're great. And then he played sick. But the man sent the doctor to his house, and the doctor said, he's okay. He finally had to come before the guy, and he confessed that I can't play a tune. And that's when the conductor said, you should have been here to face the music because it's coming. Here's the scary part, y'all. You may not want to listen to me today. Keep planning what you're playing and looking for a blessing and watch what carvers pops out of the ground. God said, you might as well face the music now. Some of you can tell you, I've been in a situation, Pastor, where I had to face the music. I had to face the music, I didn't like it, and I didn't learn from it, so I faced it over and over and over again. When you face the music, fess up, change your seed, change your planning, because seed time and harvest, God is always having it in place. Here's the good news, God said you can turn it around. How do I know that? Because our last point is believe that God is faithful. And he does not fail. Look what it said. Let us not be weary and well doing. For in due season we shall reap and we faint not. There's a blessing coming your way if you don't faint. Somebody ought to praise God right there. There's a blessing coming if you turn your seat around. There's a blessing coming. He said, since we know, you better believe that. God's word said it and God's word can't fail. And I believe it since I know that. That gives me the power. well-doing for in due season we shall reap that due season means when my harvest come can I encourage someone my brother and sister wake up dry your eyes sit up there's a harvest coming for your faithfulness there's a harvest coming for all the things you denied. There's a harvest coming for your obedience. There's a harvest coming every time you did it God's way and not your way. There's a harvest coming because you trusted God's word and you looked up to God and you respected him and you knew this was the truth. That idiom, that slang comes from the Urban Dictionary which says this is the truth and you better act on it or you're going to pay the consequences. You better believe that. You prayed already? Uh, you got money problems? God said, I'll supply all your needs. You better believe that. You sick right now? Doctors know what's wrong? God said, that I will heal you. I wish you of all things you prosper and be healthy. But most of all, he said, you can call for the daughters of the church. You better believe that. God said, don't lie. Don't cheat. Don't commit adultery. Don't treat your brother any kind of way. Forgive. You better believe that. Because you're going to reap whatever seed you plant. So why not turn this thing around and create a whole new life? God bless you. I told you this was powerful. I want you to walk around all week tell us about it. You better believe that. Find your promise. Just say, I believe it. You better believe that with all your heart. This pastor Duff is saying, God bless you. The Lord is on your side. And a harvest is coming. And you can turn that around and start you a brand new new life. God bless you. I was down but with a no way up and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living just existing well and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free.
what he did. 